Okay, so uh, welcome to the uh, last session of today, the last session before the conference dinner. Uh, just to, uh, a reminder, in the program we had a talk scheduled by uh, Sri Narayan Ashokumar on cranking an analysis of the mobile application source code. Um, unfortunately, the speaker could not make it, right? So therefore, we had uh, Ben Stock, uh, who was uh, willing to jump in. And uh, he has also a very interesting, uh, an interesting talk on uh, the extended, extended uh, same origin policy, and uh, he wants to eradicate DNS rebinding. So Ben Stock, go for it. Thank you. Okay, so this is on great. Um, so hi, my name is Ben. Um, because I actually did this talk uh, twice before, um, but only for in a 25 minutes uh, slot instead of a 40 minute slot, I actually added some new slides. Um, so I'm a first-year PhD student at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg. Um, I did my master's thesis with uh, SAP Research in Karlsruhe, um, and I want to thank or use this opportunity to thank Martin Jons to that he actually made me aware of this conference and um, also invited me to to be here. Um, I also did my during my my thesis we actually developed this um, this extended same origin policy which I'm going to present to you right now, um, and I'm currently working on basically on DOM-based cross-site scripting. Um, we have a paper for CCS um, on the topic, um, but just as a spoiler, we found um, on 9.6% of the Alexa top 5000 websites um, some form of XSS vulnerability that we could actually abuse. Um, and since I'm a PhD student, I'm quite poor, so I'm willing to do quite some, something for free drinks, and I was uh, actually challenged by um, two of my friends on Twitter um, to say the words cyber war and banana, and I hereby did this, and I think I earned like three, uh, three drinks or so. Okay, so now um, back to the serious stuff um, for the agenda. Um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about the technical background um, necessary to, to fully grasp um, our extended same origin policy. We'll then talk about DNS rebinding, so the attack we try to eradicate with um, our new um, technique. We'll then give um, an outline of how his history repeated itself in terms of DNS rebinding, so there were quite some attacks that uh, happened or quite similar attacks that actually happened over uh, a total of 17 years. Um, I will then go into detail on um, an attack we found, so um, using the HTML5 offline application cache, um, and we'll then go uh, actually into details on how to extend the same origin policy, first analyzing how the, what the semantics of the same origin policy are and how they match or do not match the, the implementations. Um, I will then end um, with a short conclusion and um, some insights on future work we are planning to do with this. Okay, so technical background. Um, so just a very, very brief introduction. Web Application 101, obviously this is, this is quite clear to all of you. We have a server, we have a browser, so a client, and those two interact with, with each other. So basically, um, the client sends an HTTP request to the, browser, uh, to the server, sorry, um, maybe containing cookies um, to authenticate uh, himself, and the, browser will then, uh, the server will then respond with uh, HTML content that is rendered in the browser. And this HTML content may actually also contain uh, active content, such as JavaScript, Flash, Silverlight, or such. And active content um, actually enables the web application to interact with the document that is presented in the browser, so using the, the DOM API, um, and also to interact with the server, not necessarily the same server it retrieved the content from. So think of um, iframes using or for iframes for advertisements um, and such and both of this is actually done in the name of the user so this is obviously security sensitive because we see it down here we have the cookie that is actually sent my, my agent to be sent to the to the server um, and also as i just said usually have um, advertisements for example that are use that use uh, iframes and in this case very obviously the advertisement will stem from, a, from an advertising network and not on, from the same server our resources were located on. So to have a kind of an isolation boundary between these two um, interacting parts, um, the access is governed by the same origin policy. So what is the same origin policy? It's interesting color up the, on the beamer. Um, the same origin policy restricts uh, access of active content to objects that share the same origin. And the origin in this case um, is the notation of the protocol, the domain and the port that um, was actually used to retrieve the object. Um, so how does this look? Quite obvious example. Um, we have this, this example here, HTTP example.org port 80. So only the first part is the protocol, so that's HTTP. Um, example.org is the domain and port is 80. 
which could also be omitted since it's the default port for, for HTTP. And um, down here we just have a small table that just to, to get your head around it. Um, if we have an, uh, we, this resource or this website wants an access, to access a resource that is located on example.org, HTTP example.org, that works perfectly because they obviously share the same origin. However, if it tries to access a resource at HTTPS example.org, we have a mismatch in the protocol. So access is then denied to that resource. Um, same holds true for um, port 8080, which is obviously a mismatch in the port. And the most obvious example is um, facebook.com, so I can't just open um, my website with kitten pictures and read all your Facebook um, posts and, and or your friends' Facebook posts, obviously. So the same origin policy is basically also used um, to protect internet resources. Um, let's assume we have this scenario. We have an attacker that's sitting out here on the internet, say, at the IP address 6666, and he wants to access a resource that is located down here at 100020, for example, um, some wiki in, in your company. And um, obviously, there is a firewall between um, the internet and the intranet, so the attacker can actually directly access the resource he wants to retrieve, but he actually is able to lure a victim so somebody who uses a computer inside um, the internet um, to browse to his site. And what he then does is he uh, embeds active content in his website that then tries to access the resource at 10.0020. So just do HTTP GET and try to read the, the, the reply and then leak it to the attacker. Obviously, as I just discussed in the last slide, the same origin policy kicks in here and prevents access because attacker.org is not the same, the same domain name as 10.0020. So, Quite obviously, we have a same origin policy mismatch, and the access to the resource is denied. So the attacker can't, can't abuse this. So DNS rebinding is actually a technique that tries to circumvent the same origin policy. So let's see the exact scenario again. We again have the attacker sitting on the internet. He wants to access a resource at 10.0020. But alongside um, the server, the web server containing this malicious content, he is also in control of the DNS server um, for attacker.org. So again, when he now lures his victim to attacker.org, what actually happens, and what I omitted in the, in the last slide, um, first of all, we do a DNS, so the browser does a DNS query. It asks the DNS server, hey, please give me the IP address of the, um, of the machine that is actually running attacker.org. Um, so in this case, the DNS server will then, in the first step, reply um, with 6.6.6.6. .6 but in this packet, the time to live um, will be set to zero, 1 or 0, so to a very low value. Um, the time to live in a DNS packet is actually the amount of time that the, the client should cache the, result, the, res the response. Sorry. Um, so basically, this means that if after more than one second we want to try it and access attacker.org again, um, we actually have to reiterate the, the DNS query. Okay, so what happens now is that we, got, we retrieve the IP address 6.6.6.6. .6. We now connect to, to the attacker's web, web server, render active content again. However, this time the active content does not try to access 100020, but actually opens a new connection to attacker.org. However, one second in this example um, might have passed by this, so you can just do set timeout or such. Um, thus, the DNS query or the DNS reply is actually expired, so the browser must now actually reiterate the query to the DNS server. So in the next step, what the, this malicious DNS server does, he replies no longer with 6.6.6.6, .6 .6 .6, but he replies with the, the IP address of the internal server the attacker wants to, wants to access. So actually what, now, what happens now is attacker.org now resolves to 10.0.0.20. The client can connect to attacker.org, which is now located on the, on the wiki server, for example, down here. And obviously the same origin policy matches because uh, attacker.org uh, is just rebound to, to this new um, IP address. And that's actually why it's called DNS rebinding. So I already said that um, history has repeated itself in um, conjunction with the same origin, uh, with the, the DNS rebinding, sorry. Um, so in 1996, um, clever students at Princeton actually found an, an even easier way. Um, what they did is actually they, um, I mean, for, for a DNS, you can reply with multiple IP addresses. This is usually done, I mean, if, you, for example, you try to look up google.com, you will actually, I think, get five um, IP addresses. This is normally used for load balancing. Um, but in this case, what they actually did is they replied with two IP addresses. The first one being the um, server we wanted uh, the applet to be loaded from, so in our example, 6.6.6.6. And the second IP address that was um, uh, replied with was actually 10.0.0.20. So 
the applet then could be downloaded, but would take the second IP address to connect to the server. And again, we had a, has, had a way around the same origin policy. Um, as a countermeasure back then, um, actually strict IP-based access control for uh, Java applets was introduced. So Java applets uh, nowadays are only allowed to connect to exactly that server they've re retrieved from, so to that IP address. So it's actually stored with the, with the applet during the lifetime of the applet, even in, in the cache or such. So this effectively stopped exactly this kind of attack. Then in 2002, um, there were actually two attacks. Quick swap DNS is basically what I explained um, when I was talking about the general uh, construct of DNS rebinding. And um, what also um, some clever researchers found was um, they could abuse domain relaxation to um, conduct DNS rebinding attacks. The domain relaxation is actually a means um, if you have a, if you have two different um, applications running on two different uh, sub-level sub domains or subdomains, um, maybe they want to interact with each other. So what they actually can do is they can relax their, their origin or their domain. Um, so this actually means they can say, okay, I now want to be in the, in the context, basically, of my, of my father, of my parent domain. So basically what the, the attack was about, um, we have an, a, a domain that is called evil.attacker.org, which is actually pointing to our, our web server on the, on the outside, on the internet, and we have attacker.org that is actually mapped to 10.0.0.20, so the IP address we want to uh, retrieve content from. Um, then inside the script, we can just say, okay, document that domain uh, equals attacker.org, therefore, or thereby relaxing the, the, um, the domain to its parent domain, and then accessing the resource at 10.0.0.20. So as a countermeasure, um, nowadays browsers implement explicit domain relaxation, meaning that if you have two resources um, and they want to inter interact with, with each other, they both need to explic explicitly set their, their the document domain property. So even the father domain has to actually say, okay, I am really attacker.org. And basically your corporate wiki will um, most likely not, not do this. Um, and the second countermeasure was, um, introduced, um, that was introduced was DNS pinning. Um, what browsers nowadays do is actually they cache, um, they, they ignore the time to live value of the, um, of the DNS reply and cache the IP address that was first retrieved. So uh, therefore, um, we can't do this rebinding step anymore because the second query that was iterated um, or that was, that was uh, given to the, to the DNS server is actually no longer taking place. So we can't uh, let the, force the victim to uh, then rebind the domain to 10.0.0.20. Um, and the browser actually, yeah, depending on the implementation, so in some browsers there's actually a timeout, a very long timeout of like an hour or such, um, and in other browsers they just store it until the, um, the browser is closed. Then in 2006, um, my colleague Martin Jones actually discovered, together with another researcher, um, another nice way to get around the same origin policy or to re-enable DNS rebinding. Um, Firefox and Internet Explorer at that time, um, when they tried to access um, a server, and that server would send uh, would not be reachable, so basically the port was closed or such, they would drop the DNS cache um, and then reiterate the query. This was actually done to, to be able to do failover, so if the server was no longer there, then just try to resolve the domain again um, to get the new IP address of the server. Um, but actually, quite obviously, you can abuse this by just answering the first reply and then on the second, or answering the first query, sorry, and on the second um, uh, request from the browser, you just drop the connection and then it will uh, reiterate the DNS um, query. Actually, this was also used, um, or actually led also to many vulnerabilities um, in conjunction with uh, several um, active content plugins. So uh, JavaScript, Flash, Java, so basically every plugin there was. Um, and it, this even allowed socket communication. So another countermeasure, so we had another attack and we put another band-aid on it. Um, in HTTP 1.1, the client must always send uh, the host header. So the host header is um, actually a commodity feature that is used um, so you can have multiple domains on just one IP address and the server still knows, okay, which content should I deliver to the, to the client right now. Um, and the host header checking just means, okay, the application must then check whether the host header is actually matching um, the, the domain that um, this, this application runs on. Uh, and another as another countermeasure for the plugins, um, they actually got very restrictive um, when it came to network capabilities. Um, so, for example, Silverlight by default can connect to like I think 10 ports, 4,500 something. Um, so this is this is not feasible to to uh, use Silverlight um, in, in DNS rebinding attacks or in socket communication attacks. 
Okay, so now we're in 2013, um, and actually we discovered a, a new technique that we could use to uh, again and re-enable DNS rebinding. Um, and so the basic idea is to abuse the cache. So every browser has obviously a cache, and our, our um, instinct is that if we are able to cache a resource within the, with the browser's cache, um, so long that the, IP, uh, the domain to IP mapping is dropped, um, then we can actually re-enable DNS rebinding, because then if, for example, a certain piece of flash is still in the cache, um, this certain piece of flash can then connect to attacker.org, um, get the new IP address for attacker.org, and uh, do DNS rebinding again. However, we have a problem, because normal caching behavior in the browser can actually not be influenced by us. Um, this comes from the fact that this cache is set by, or is, is restricted um, in size by user settings. And also, if you, normal, if you do normal browsing on, on your uh, computer, you actually have a lot of pictures and such that are actually stored in the cache. So this is not something that is reliable. So we can actually say, OK, if the victim comes back to us in, after one day, our content will still be there. However, the HTML5 cache, uh, app cache, sorry, um, actually enables um, for a web developer um, a controllable caching behavior. And for us as an attacker in this, in this scenario, um, it allows us to store resources so long um, until we can actually be sure that the DNS pinning times or timeout has, has expired or the browser has been closed before. Okay, so how does the app cache actually work? Um, as I said okay, already, a developer can actually say, okay, I want to I store certain resources um, in the browser or in the, in the application cache. This is mainly used for uh, bandwidth uh, reduction um, and also to allow offline applications. So basically, you can just um, have an application, for example, on your mobile phone that is completely in the offline cache, and you don't need to be online to, to use this application. So in HTML5, there was a new attribute added um, to the HTML node in the HTML uh, documents called manifest. And the manifest actually contains a link to um, a manifest file, and this manifest file then states which resources should be, uh, should be put into the application cache. And it looks something like this. So this basically, this cache manifest file um, tells the browser, please cache for me example.org index.php and example.org uh, slash flash svf. Um, the whole process works as such. We have a browser and um, our, our web server. Um, the browser connects to the web server, retrieves the um, HTML, um, where it finds the manifest attribute and the manifest file. It then downloads the manifest file, and in turn, after analyzing the file and looking at which resources to cache, it stores them in the, in the application cache um, in the browser. So if we, again, go to the same website, and um, we assume that um, actually the index file was also um, cached, um, then the first request will not actually go to the server, but will go to the, to the uh, cache, the app, offline application cache. From there, we retrieve all the content, run or execute the, the whole page, so render the page, run JavaScript as such, and only after we're done with that, we actually re retrieve the manifest again to see whether it has changed or not. So this is actually done um, so you can have the benefits of caching, so it would not make that much sense if you have caching and then have, a, have to do a request first to see has have any resources changed. Um, but you actually run it once and then check afterwards um, to de decide whether um, the resources that are currently in the cache should be dropped um, or should be updated or such. Okay, so how can we use this in, in terms of DNS rebinding? Um, we are able to persistently store certain resources in the app cache. So say, okay, we, we want to uh, store resources from attacker.org, so maybe even the index file and, and flash or such, um, in the application cache. We then let the victim wait until the victim closes the browser and lure the victim again to our website. Um, on the second try, we actually um, hand out for the DNS query, so we hand out the internal server IP address. However, since the resources are cached, um, the website is rendered just as it was before. Um, and so we can actually do, again, DNS rebinding, because now we are in complete control of attacker.org, so we, we can map it basically to any uh, internet host we, we want to we wanna attack. Um, and then we can obviously retrieve sensitive data and leak it back to the attacker. However, there is a catch in that. So I said on the previous slide that in the last step um, of, this, of this caching uh, process or retrieving from cache process, the browser actually um, tries to get the manifest file again. So in the fifth step, the manifest file is again downloaded, and remember, it was hosted at attacker.org. However, attacker.org is now no longer hosted on the 6.6.6.6 .6 .6 .6 web server, but it's pointing to the internet host. 
So quite obviously, the manifest file will not be there on the internet host. So in this case, the browser then drops all the data that is um, stored in the application cache, and we only have one shot to actually retrieve content from, from uh, any given server. However, if, for example, we have a corporate wiki, it might take some time to actually go through all the pages and retrieve all the interesting content. Um, so nicely enough, there is actually a, a pretty neat solution to that. We can actually use um, cross-domain caching. So say we have two domains. We have attacker1.org and we have attacker2.org. Um, attacker1.org is only responsible for hosting um, our index file and the manifest file. And in um, attacker2.org, we actually uh, attacker1.org, sorry, we actually embed, for example, a flash from attacker2.org. Um, the problem with flash, um, which is very very important to our attack, actually, um, normally, for example, if you have if you have a script that you include from a different host then all the script's content will actually run in your context, so in your origin of your website. However, for Flash applets, they don't adopt, so to say, the, the origin of the page they are embedded into, but they still have the same origin um, they actually were retrieved from. So what this means is that Flash SVF, although it is actually running on the website attacker1.org, um, is running in the context of attacker2.org. So what we can now do is, on attacker1.org, we say, okay, please cache for us, this SVF file here. Um, we then wait for the victim to close the browser, lure the victim again to attacker1.org, which still has this, this um, object uh, embedded, so the flash object embedded. Um, still, this contains the, or has the origin of attacker2.org, but again, we rebind attacker2.org, and this way, actually, um, we are able to, again, do DNS rebinding, and the most important thing here, in the final step, um, the manifest file is actually downloaded from attacker1.org, which is still mapped to our attacker's IP address. So this actually allows us to do it persistently, so we can actually abuse this if we were able to lure the victim to our side over and over again. We can actually enumerate hosts in, this, in the net network by just rebinding attacker2.org every time to another IP address. So this is actually a pretty neat attack. Um, so just as a, as a small example, we also have this in our paper we presented at Usenix last week. Um, as a small attack scenario, so I, at Usenix I actually got the question, so is a wiki is, is it really an, uh, a target? Because in our wiki we need some form of authentication. Um, it might still be a problem. Um, for example, SAP uses um, uh, authentication based on certificates. And as far as I know, you only have to click on um, yes, I want to send this certificate once. So once you're authenticated, actually, the, if the browser is still running, it can access all the content that is actually privileged, and um, you need to be authenticated to, to retrieve it. Um, in our paper, we actually discuss CUPS. So I guess most of you um, know CUPS. It's a well-known Unix printing system, and it actually employs host header checking in its application. So you can actually change anything over the CUPS interface um, using DNS rebinding. However, um, as I said, applications must actually perform the host header checking. And there are actually two files um, that CUPS lets you access over its, uh, over its web server, and that is the um, error log, and that's the access log, uh, the print log, sorry. So this actually, if I was an attacker and wanted to find out what is going on at SAP right now, I could just use this to actually read all the CUPS logs um, retrieve IP addresses of printers, uh, email addresses of printer administrators, um, and also uh, the names of the files that were printed. So this often might also may, may actually be um, uh, a good indicator on what's going on inside the company right now. So this is obviously a problem, and this cannot be fixed using the host header, host header check because it's actually just a text file that we can, that we can leak here. Okay, so we're back to history repeating again. So in 2013, we discovered the, the offline application attack. Um, it works pretty well on all desktop browsers, except for Internet Explorer. Um, we still have this, this one-shot chance on, on Internet Explorer, um, but Internet Explorer actually doesn't allow cross-domain caching, so we can't use our advanced attack scenario. Um, also, it works quite nicely on mobile browsers, um, but again, not for cross-domain, but nevertheless, we can even, even exploit mobile browsers. Um, and actually, just um, one week ago at, at Wood um, in Washington, um, Dai and Resig presented their paper called Fire Drill. Um, they actually um, make use of the fact that the, the DNS cache is not endless, so they just resolve a lot of bogus domains, and therefore 
evicting um, the, the, the pinned entry from the DNS cache and thereby re-enabling um, DNS rebinding again. However, um, so actually our work was done like half a year ago or such. I just read this on the plane to, to Washington and was very happy to see that our approach actually fixes this, um, even though I, we didn't actually know about the attack before. And that's um, what's up next. So um, I want to talk to you about the uh, extended same origin policy. Um, so the same origin policy's duty is to uh, isolate unrelated web applications from each other based on the origins of the interacting resources. Um, I guess you all got that uh, at least from my, from my introduction. Um, and the semantics of the same origin policy are actually built around two entities. So we have a web client or a browser that is actually, um, that's actually whose duty is it to enforce the policy. And we have a web server that provides the resources that are actually subject to the policy. So in a perfect world, those two entities would all also be the ones that were involved in the security decision. However, they are actually not, as we see in the case of DNS rebinding, because the entity providing information for the, um, for the decision that is actually in, done inside the, the web client or the browser is the DNS server, because it provides the link between a domain name and an IP address. And as we have seen, the domain the DNS server may not actually be trusted. So the domain, server, domain um, name server might actually be uh, under the control of, of the victim. So quite obviously, we have a principal mismatch here um, in the semantics versus the implementation of, of the same origin policy. And our idea um, is actually to fix this, this um, mismatch in the, in the implementation uh, of the same origin policy. For that, we had four design goals in mind. Um, design goal one is we want to have client-side enforcement. So the same origin policy, quite obviously, is a client-side policy. So we want to make sure that the security decision is actually done inside the client and not on, on the web server or by the DNS server or, or such. Design goal two is um, we want to make sure that it's actually done in the protocol layer because it's a protocol layer problem. Um, it, by, by using DNS, actually. Um, so we don't want to have applications that need to be changed to, to um, enable host status checking. And as we saw in the example of, uh, of CUPS, sometimes interesting data is not even located inside an application as such, but it might be a log file or, or a text file or such. Um, we want to have this for, uh, as a dedicated security functionality. So the host header is actually a commodity feature to run multiple domains on one IP address. It's not actually was not designed to do, to do security. Um, and you never know what's going to happen in 10 years. So maybe in 10 years, the host header will have some other meaning. Um, and then actually, it, this might actually break something. Um, and our design goal four for, for a new policy is actually we want to be non-disruptive. So if we have a web server or a web client that does not implement our approach, we don't want to break existing web applications. That would be really bad. Um, thus, or in our analysis, we also show that the only the, the web server should actually be capable of setting its own trust boundaries. So the web server should say, okay, these resources are okay, they, they may access uh, my content, but now what's actually happening is the client tries to guess this boundary using the triple protocol port and domain um, that are used in the same origin policies decision-making process. Um, and actually, yeah, that's based on information that was actually delivered by the network or the DNS server, so it's not necessarily the web server that is actually in, uh, involved. And thus, we've, we aim to fix this mismatch in the, in the implementation and the semantics of the same origin policy. So we propose to extend the same origin policy with some form of server-provided input that is actually delivered through an HTTP header, but not the host header, or well, host header is a request header anyways, um, but not through an existing header, um, but through a new one. So we propose that we actually extend um, this triple of the protocol port uh, and domain with a so-called server origin. And this is, should be delivered um, by the server in its response as a, as a header. Um, okay, so how does the um, same origin policy's decision logic look like? So we have um, an accessing resource, which is denoted by A, and we have a target resource that is denoted by T over here. So the first line basically is the old same origin policy, so we still want to make sure that protocol domain and port match. However, we ascertain that in also the second criterion must be fulfilled. So the domain name of the accessing resource must actually be contained in the server origin of the target resource. Um, and if the, ser the server origin is not sent by the server, for example, by, because it doesn't implement um, our same origin policy, um, then the second criterion evaluates to true. Um, if you look at this, this is quite obvious that if the header is not sent or not set, then actually we fall back to the old same origin policy decision and, and uh, don't break anything. 
So as a small example, um, say 100020 tells that its origin is actually 100020 and wiki.corp. Um, and so the second part of the, um, of the same origin policy decision, decision looks at is attacker.org actually contained in 100020 or wiki.corp? Quite obviously it's not, so the access um, to the resource is actually denied and um, our resources or our internet resources are protected. Okay, so summarizing the extended same origin policy, um, obviously we are able to do this on the client side, so we meet design goal one. We use an HTTP header, um, so we don't necessarily have to touch, uh, touch any running applications, but we can do this on the, in the server module or such. Um, the HTTP header is only used for security, so we have no side effects from header specifications uh, maybe changing at some point, and browsers can actually fall back to the old same origin policy when the header is not sent, and therefore being um, uh, adhering, adhering to design goal four, not breaking anything. Um, we implemented, to, to prove the valid validity of our approach, um, a very small prototype into Chromium. It's basically only consistent of um, uh, header extraction, which is done anyway. So um, the header, headers are parsed anyway, and they are put into a, an array um, inside the browser. And then in that array, we just need to do string matching, so to see whether our origin is actually um, contained or not. So the overhead is, is close to zero. I mean, it's just uh, string matching. Uh, I guess the network latency is way, way higher. Okay, so how does this actually look? Um, this is uh, the implementation logic for um, XML HTTP requests. Um, so the first decision, so most of this is actually from the original code and not, not our um, contribution. So we have first the decision, is this the same domain request or not? Um, so I'm going to get uh, into that part um, at the end of my talk very, very quickly. If it's the same domain request, so attacker.org tries to access attacker.org, we now add this check here. So we say, okay, this X server origin header must be checked, and only if this same origin header, uh, this server origin header is set and our uh, criterion is met, so the accessing domain is actually contained in, in this list, we allow, allow access to the, to the response, um, to the accessing JavaScript application, for example. Okay, as a conclusion, the same origin policy is the most basic security policy that is uh, exists in the browser. It is, its duty is to un uh, isolate unrelated web applications from each other nowadays based on information um, on the origin of interacting resources, so basically protocol domain and port as I've shown before. DNS rebinding effectively uh, circumvents the same origin policy by actually um, binding two different IP addresses to the same, to the same domain. Um, and actually, vulnerabilities have been discovered in 1996, 2002, 2006, and 2013. So here we are, 17 years later, we see that DNS rebinding is actually a protocol level flaw because there is a mismatch, as I discussed already, in, this, in the semantics and the implementation of the same origin policy. And thus, we, said we decided to enhance the same origin policy with explicit server origin, so something that was explicitly sent by the web server to set its trust boundaries, and we could actually implement our approach in Chromium, and it proved to have no overhead. Um, another question I got at Usenix was, okay, but this is opt-in. So uh, you say, okay, you have design goal for you, so you don't want to break anything. However, this is opt-in on the, on the target side. So if you're a corporation and you don't want your da data to be stolen, you'll just go this so small step and just uh, implement our, our approach. Okay, so um, going to future work. Um, actually, we're now discussing um, of rethinking the notion of an origin in the browser. Um, so actually thinking about, okay, shouldn't we replace the same origin policy as it is right now? Um, this could actually enable um, uh, an application, say we have an application that runs at example.org, and it runs again, or another similar application runs at example.com. So why shouldn't those two domains say, okay, we are actually the same application? So by setting, by setting the, the server origin uh, and saying, okay, I am okay with being used as example.org and example.com, we could actually widen the trust boundaries and the server would then say, okay, this is exactly my trust boundary and it's not the client that has to, has to guess this anymore. Um, we, could, we should and we could also apply the newly developed same origin policy to other parts of the browser itself. Um, so for example, um, password managers, um, they store credentials, so if I'm able to to send um, just a site that says, for, for example, so I, if I rebind facebook.com and Facebook uh, employs no host header checking, the victim just enters his credentials. And if I then later on use um, the same domain and now point it to, let it point to my server, then the password manager will actually have stored the credentials 
for facebook.com, so where the user actually logged in, under my domain attacker.org, which is easily uh, extractable um, using cross-site scripting, or in this case, just my JavaScript. Um, also, post message is a, is a candidate in post message. Um, the sending resource is actually only identified by the URL. So this is also a problem uh, in, in terms of DNS rebinding. And what's also very important is to adopt the new policy to, for, for plugins. Um, so actually, Flash is really bad, um, as I said before, um, because Flash doesn't even uh, implement the complete same origin policy. They don't even use the port. So if I have a Flash applet, I can actually use this to connect to any port on, on the server on the target machine. Um, so this is obviously um, quite, a, quite a big issue. Um, and this should be uh, implemented into plugins as well. Um, and then we also have to think, rethink the course-like um, pre-flight requests. So course is cross-origin resource sharing, actually allowing um, an application to access a resource that is located on another server. This server then sets um, the, the appropriate course setters and says, okay, it's okay for you to access this resource. So I'm going to get back to, to, to this now really short or really quickly. Um, so now we take a look at the right part. Um, we look at, okay, we, have, we don't have the same domain request. Um, and then we look, okay, is this a complex request or is it a simple request? A complex request is a request that actually set, sets some headers. This is basically used. Um, so if you have cores and you, or if you, if you don't have cores headers set and you try to um, do an XHR, XHR so uh, XML HTTP request to say facebook.com, then the browser will actually download facebook.com, so access the resource, but then we'll check afterwards if the same origin policy is actually fulfilled or not. So it will download the resource, it will access the resource, but it will not allow access to the content. This obviously um, might be a problem if you have a certain actions that can be triggered by just visit, visiting a website. Um, in course, the specification says, okay, just with a usual normal GET request, we assume that no damage can be done. But however, if, for example, we can do a, a, a request that has complex headers set, so for example, for authentication or using cookies or such, then we do a pre-flight request. That means we first, before we actually try to contact this, um, the resource, we send an options request to the resource and say, okay, hi, is, this, is it okay if I allow an access to you or not? And then the server, on the, the, so the target server, can actually say, okay, it's, it's okay, you, you may access the resource. And only then the request is actually sent. Um, because actually, if this was not the case, there might actually be state-changing operations um, going on by, by just uh, doing XXR, X, uh, XHR, sorry. Um, even though maybe the, the access to the resource itself was denied, so the, the JavaScript running on attacker.org could not actually um, read the content, but it might trigger an action um, on, the, on the server side. So we need to rethink um, our notion um, of, of this server origin check is it, a, is it also a problem? Might we have problems it, with, with this kind of um, state-changing um, requests as well? So, and should we actually do um, one pre-flight request for each and every um, request that also goes to, to same origin uh, resources? But this is actually an open, open problem we're discussing right now. And uh, yeah, that's just wanted to share this with you. Okay, so with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, and uh, I'm happy uh, to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions from the audience? Are people getting tired? <laughs> okay, I have, uh, I have one question. So, um, did you approach uh, some standard committee like WC3 or so to, to wrap this within a standard or so? Okay, so now, right now we're actually in the, the process of um, getting a more in-depth view of our ideas, especially if it comes coming to, to plugins and such. Um, I actually talked to, to Frederick Braun from uh, Mozilla, who's also giving a talk tomorrow. Um, and he also said we should actually um, discuss this um, first internally and then do a proposal to um, the uh, W3C. Um, but since this now, also our implementation only looks at browsers specifically and not plugins and such, um, we haven't yet approached those, uh, those guys, but um, I think it's um, down the road somewhere from here. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, if not, then please uh, thank the speaker again.